2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And we'll look at uh, verse 6 into the conclusion of the chapter. We're going to finish our study here in 2 Thessalonians uh, by starting at verse 6 and going into the conclusion at verse 18. Uh, as is my normal way of approaching our studies, I'm going to give you a, a lot of background, a lot of information, a lot of uh, foundational things, and move into uh, the subject of uh, dealing with the disorderly, because that's what's being spoken of, at least in the first few verses of, uh, that we'll be looking at from verse 6 following. And so let's begin reading together at verse 6, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We'll read to verse 12, and we'll get into our study. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning at verse 6, reading to verse 12. Paul writes, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness, and eat their own bread. And so at this point, Paul begins to close his letter, and he's doing so with what we would call an exhortation. It's an exhortation to the believers. And uh, allow me to develop a context so that we can view this passage within that context. He had just written, I am confident that you will do the things that we command you. He had said that in verse 4. So his next words are specifically giving orders that he expects them to obey. Now, the command he's giving is not something that is his own idea. He's commanding them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that in verse 6. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This isn't something that he's commanding them. This is something that he is commanding them in the name of Jesus Christ. In other words, he's exercising his apostolic authority. And the church is not to think that they can rebel against this command. Because if they were to rebel, if they were to reject the command he's giving them, they would not be rebelling against human authority alone, but against Jesus Christ himself. So that helps to emphasize the seriousness of his command to them. And so in verse 6, it, it is so concerning that that Paul is commanding them to do something that is very serious. Notice what he's commanding them to do. He's commanding them to withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. The word withdraw is a word that speaks of cautiously drawing away from someone. It's a word that was used to describe a military commander who was silently avoiding a confrontation. So Paul is directly commanding them to withdraw socially from other believers. And that's a very serious command. Because when you read your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, we have been created for fellowship. We have been intended by God's creation to fellowship with Him and to have fellowship with one another. You see that from the beginning. You see that God created man in His own image to have relationship with man. God created woman a woman came alongside a man for fellowship with her and him and with God. It's all through the Bible. So when you have someone commanding you to withdraw, that's a very serious thing. And so we'll be looking at that because we've been commanded and created for fellowship. But he says withdraw. Withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition. When he uses the word tradition, it's a systematic teaching of the gospel message. When he speaks of the tradition, it speaks of a whole council, the whole council of God. The council of God that they received 
and we're continuing to receive. And what, what is so concerning about this is that he's concerned that the fellowship that they're having with somebody walking disorderly is going to influence and affect them. Some, he says, in verse 6 and in another place, is uh, some are walking in, he says, a disorderly manner. Now, when he uses the word disorderly, the word disorderly can mean out of rank. It's used really to speak concerning of soldiers. It, it speaks of deviating. You know, when I was in the military, we, we, we go into basic training, and they line us up in columns, and then you have uh, your drill sergeant, and your drill sergeant begins to call cadence, and he'll say to the left, to the left, to the left, right, left, as you're beginning to march. And so you'll be in columns of three, four, or more, and then they'll go stretching back to 60 people or more. And so you're to be walking in an orderly fashion. And so because of that, you'll have the drill sergeant who's walking off to the side, and he'll say it to the left, to the left, to the left, right, left. The reason he does that is because there's always guys who are going to the right, to the right, to the right, left, right. We'll be marching, and there'll be somebody out of step. And it just throws the whole column off. And so we learn through cadence how to walk in an orderly fashion. And so when he's speaking concerning those who are walking in a disorderly fashion, he's saying that the whole uh, column can't go forward because somebody is interrupting the flow. And so this is something very important to understand. He's speaking of someone deviating from the prescribed order of rule. It can speak also of someone who's being unruly. So he's addressing the fact that some in the fellowship are still refusing to work. And this apparently is a continuing problem in the church. Now he had just written concerning their habit of obeying spiritual direction. Now verse 4 was a statement that he was blessed by their previous and continued obedience. And now he issues a command that would be difficult to keep but is necessary to obey. Now for some, the fact that Paul would issue this kind of command is disturbing that's because they do not yet understand the place of spiritual leadership. With so much spiritual abuse, they are rightly concerned about being taken advantage of. And there are people today who have seen spiritual abuse, and so when someone says, you need to do this or don't do that, well, naturally they're saying to themselves, why would I listen to you? Why would I follow your directives? And so they resist following the order because of experiences perhaps that they've had in the past. But one of the things I'd like to say is, I'd like to say that in the early church, God established leadership, and the leadership was intended to feed and care for the body of Christ. And Jesus was speaking to the apostle Peter in John chapter 21, and, and as Jesus was speaking to the apostle Peter, he told him that, he said, if you love me, then tend and feed the lambs and, and the sheep. Now, that's what is called pastoral leadership. It's to be done with gentleness and love. And as the Lord Jesus Christ is ministering to him, Peter learned the lesson of gentle leadership, and, and he passed it on to future pastors. In 1 Peter 5, 2 and 3, he wrote, be, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So notice how Peter said, serve willingly. Do not be greedy. Be eager to serve. Do not lord it over those entrusted to you. Be examples to the flock. So pastors are to serve as examples of the Christian life. We are not to excuse ourselves from God's commands and his directives. But none of us is perfect. The only perfect example we have is Jesus Christ. But we are called to live as examples, an example that others can follow. In the book of Hebrews 13, verse 7, it reads, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. In Philippians 4, verse 9, Paul said, The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So for pastors, the greatest concern is for the sheep to follow closely after the Lord. And when spiritual commands are given, they're intended to help the sheep in order to mature. 
In 1 Corinthians 7, 35, Paul said, This I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper, and, what, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. So spiritual authority is to be exercised for building up the people of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 8 reads, Even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed. We have authority not to destroy. We've been given authority to edify. While some may want to exercise spiritual authority, but it's not something that is taken lightly. In the end, we give an account to the Lord concerning how we wield it. It's something that the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 13, verse 17. He said, obey those who rule over you. Be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy, not with grief. That would be unprofitable for you. Ultimately, I, as the shepherd of this particular congregation, will give an account of how I ministered. And those who are under our leadership will do the same. So he says to them in verse 6, withdraw yourselves from every brother who walks disorderly. So we see Paul giving them an order. And the order that he's giving them is to enact what is called church discipline. Church discipline is done in two basic ways. You have what is called preventive and you have what is called uh, corrective. Preventive is the teaching of the Word of God. Whenever the Word of God is rightly divided and presented and people are hearing and adhering to God's Word, that's a way of preventing them from moving into the second, which is corrective. Because when the Word of God is rightly divided, presented accurately, the Holy Spirit is present, moving in the hearts of those receiving they ultimately are gaining at that point an accountability to God. They've heard and therefore they must obey. But when they fail to obey, the second installment of it may come into play, which is to correct. And corrective is always done with love and gentleness. It's always done with the word of God and the spirit of, of love. And, and that's what takes place. But we have something that is called church discipline. We need to remember that the church is a living organization, but it's under spiritual authority. Jesus is the head of the church. He appoints leaders to care for it. And in the church, there are those who violate the clear teachings of Scripture. So normally, correcting erring members can be as simple as simply speaking to them, talking to them after church, or seeing them somewhere and asking how they're doing, what's going on, how can I be of help, and, and bringing correction that way. But sometimes they refuse to hear, and they continue living improperly. And when they do, their unchecked sin has a way of impacting other people. Paul spoke of this in the case of the Corinthians who had to deal with sin in the church. When you read 1 Corinthians and, all, and into 2 Corinthians, you'll see that there was a man in the church who had committed a sin that Paul said even the Greeks look at as being disgusting, that a man should be having sexual relationships with his father's wife. He said, rather than repenting with grief and, and sorrow, you, you're rejoicing over it. He said, this thing is not good. And so Paul had to order them to deal with this sin. And he spoke concerning what this sin will do in the church. He said in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Don't you understand that if you have a small piece of, uh, of leaven, if you, if you place that into a lump of dough, that that yeast, that leaven, is going to saturate the entire lump of dough. It may be small at the beginning, but it has a way of permeating, and sin does that. He says you need to understand that you have to deal with this, or else the entire church is going to be infected with that man's sin, at least a toleration of something that God doesn't tolerate. So church discipline is intended to prevent sin from spreading to preserve holiness, and to bring correction to the one who is in sin. It's intended to restore sinning believers as well as to warn the rest of the church. If an elder had done something that was, that was wrong, well, 1 Timothy 5 verse 20 speaks of disciplining him openly so that the rest of the church may fear. So how do you go about that? How do you handle these kinds of things? Well, Church discipline is carried through by elders in the church. If somebody is in sin and one of his brothers approaches, and approaches him and says, you need to deal with this, and he doesn't deal with it, 
Then that, that man who spoke to him will bring, or that person who spoke to him will bring a witness who can verify. So you have a second witness. And Jesus taught us this in Matthew 18, verses 13 through 17. And he said, if you see somebody in error and you bring correction and they listen to you, you've won your brother. But if he refuses, bring somebody with you once again and validate it. If he refuses to hear, then take it to the church. What that means is bring it to the leadership. And the leadership there begins to deal with it. And if that person still refuses, then at that point, he's asked not to be back in that fellowship until he corrects his behavior. A church elder will normally sit with the person and explain the situation. Scripture will be applied. There'll be an encouragement to see the problem and to repent. And that's all to be done with the spirit of humility and grace. Paul made it clear that it's to be exercised with kindness and humility by the spiritually mature. In Galatians 6 verse 1, he said, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. While well, Paul had addressed this situation in his first letter, he had told the church to live honorably before the Lord, before the community, before one another. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, he said, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, just as we told you. He went on in chapter 5, verse 14 of 1 Thessalonians, and he said, We urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. So he had already encouraged and commanded them to deal with this, but they hadn't corrected the problem. And now he's saying you need to deal with it. Verse 6 again, withdraw yourself. Withhold intimate fellowship. Allow a gap to form, showing the brother that he is separating himself from his brothers and sisters in the church. Do not continue to associate with them. Do not continue being used by them, being taken advantage in the name of Jesus. So this is necessary because this kind of selfishness destroys the unity of the church. When somebody selfishly takes advantage of other people, it causes the church to grumble. And sometimes when someone feels taken advantage of, they get hurt and then they leave. When they leave, they often take others with them. It undermines the work of the church, the unity of the church. And throughout Scripture, God desires the church to dwell in unity. Because when a church dwells in unity, God can be glorified. It's, when, it's so important, this unity, that Jesus himself in John 17, verses 20 and 21, prayed for it. He said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you, may they also be one in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So unity is something that needs to be prized and closely guarded, which is why in Ephesians 4, verse 3, Paul said, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now notice in verse 6 how Paul labels those who refuse to work disorderly, rejectors of traditions. Now how had they become disorderly? What led them to stop working? Well, it would seem that they thought, if Jesus is coming soon, why should we keep on working? What's the point of it? I got saved in a time when the rapture was once again being not so much rediscovered, but being popularized in teachings. And I was raised in a discipline that, that never mentioned the word rapture. I didn't have any clue that Jesus Christ was going to take the church off of planet Earth. I'd never been taught that. It isn't that I was some, you know, frequent attendee of church. I had gone as a young person, but I had never heard that, uh, that one day that the Lord was going to remove the church from the face of the earth. I didn't know that. And so when I got saved, that was part of what I was being taught. And, and I have to tell you, man, I mean, hearing that, that Jesus Christ is coming soon thrilled my heart. Now, again, I, I was raised in the... In the 50s to the 
uh, late 60s into 1970. And, and in that time, you know, hippies were making a lot of noise in our society. Lots of songs were being written concerning what we needed was love and we needed to realize we're one big family. We're all children of God and, and Woodstock and all of those things had taken place. And there was a great longing within a lot of the youth at that time to, to be part of community, to be part of a family. And we began to look at it as, oh, we're all God's children. We're all brothers and sisters. And there was all of that kind of talk going on at that time. But as a person who had, had gone through the 60s into 1970, and, and I didn't see any of the, any of the things we, we sang about. I didn't see the peace. I didn't see the love. I didn't see the unity. I didn't see any of that. All I saw was taking advantage of one another, uh, doing a lot of drugs, getting drunk all of the time, things like that. I, I didn't see any of, the, of those songs coming to pass. And, and, and so I was still wanting community, and I was still wanting to know what love was, and I was still wanting those things, the peace and the joy and all of that. And that's why when the gospel was preached to me, that's why my heart was open. And when I heard, you know, what's keeping you from these things is your sin, that's why I repented. And that's why I realized, listen, the alcohol wasn't doing me any good. The drugs weren't doing me any good. The lifestyle I chose wasn't doing me any good. The relationships that I found myself in were not fruitful. They, they, they ended quickly. They, they ended with pain. And, and I know there's something wrong in it. And I still remember the day when I finally said to myself, the problem isn't them, the problem is you. And when I heard the gospel, which agreed with that, the problem is you. That's how I gave my heart to Christ. Now I'm going to church. And as I go to church, I'm hearing of something called the rapture. Well, at the same time, all of my hippie friends are hearing the same message. And I had guys I knew, this was real big in the early days of the movement, where they were saying, listen, if Jesus is coming soon, Let's just charge our credit cards to the limit and leave the bill to the Antichrist. And so we thought, yeah, that's it. We'll stick them with our bill. Well, that was a long time ago, and they're still paying on those credit cards. <laughs> but see, what he's talking about isn't new. What he's talking about took place when they had heard Christ is coming soon. They began to live irresponsibly. And because they weren't working, they began to use their brothers and their sisters. They were the ones in church who would walk up and look around to make sure nobody saw them. And they'd say, listen, man, I'm, uh, I'm short a few dollars. And I've got to put some gas in my car. And, and can you, can you spare, me, spare me some money? I'll, I'll give you it back next week. You know, we used to have a... Popeye cartoon, and there was a character called Wimpy, and Wimpy would say, I, I gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today, and that was kind of the attitude of a lot of people, you know, <laughs> just give me something, you know, and I'll pay you back, which they didn't do, and so that isn't new. That is something that was taking place in the early church. Paul had already corrected that. He had already said, you shouldn't be doing this. Make sure that they that they, uh, they work and, and take care of their own bills. It wasn't something Jesus taught us to do. Jesus didn't tell us, well, I'm returning, therefore do nothing. In Luke 19, verses 12 and 13, he said, this is speaking of Jesus, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas, said to them, occupy, do business till I come. He said, be busy until I come. Occupy till I come. The point that Jesus was teaching is Christians are to be busy serving him until he returns. So the return of Christ is not to motivate us to laziness. It's, it's intended to motivate us to action. And Paul in Romans 13 said that in verses 11 and 12. He said, do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And so he's saying, be busy. To encourage them, he uses himself 
as an example. He says in verse 7, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you. Though Paul believed the rapture to be imminent, he continued to work. And so he reinforces his moral authority because he's saying, my life has been consistent with my teachings. Moral authority is established and kept through a consistent moral lifestyle, a living what you're giving. In Philippians 3.17, he said, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Now, what is it that he's pointing to in regards to his pattern of life? Well, notice in verse 7, he says, for we were not disorderly among you. We did not get out of rank. We kept our place. We discharged all our duties. He's saying, I was not lazy. I worked to supply my needs. I worked and I was an example. So Paul made that claim to them. He used himself as an example. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10, he said, You remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses. God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. So he says, we were not disorderly among you. Second, in verse 8, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge. We didn't live at someone else's expense. We didn't use other people so that we were comfortable. He goes on in verse 9, not because we don't have authority, but to make ourselves an example. The fact is, I could have made demands. I'm an apostle of Christ. You see, he could have rightly received compensation for the spiritual work that he was doing. To the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he said to them, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? In 1 Corinthians 9 verse 14, he said, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. So he should be cared for, but he refused to use his authority in an ungodly way. His desire was to be an example to them. 1 Corinthians 9, 12, he said, If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. So he worked day and night in order to relieve them from the burden of caring for him. He didn't want to impose himself upon them. Notice how he says in verse 10, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. This is a command. If any will not work, neither shall he eat. A Christian must do everything in his power to earn a living. We are to do our best to find work to support ourselves and also be generous to others. Titus 3.14 says, Let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. He says, For, verse 11, we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner. This is the fruit of laziness, because he says, not working at all. But this is a word we don't use very much, if at all, anymore, but our busybodies. That's not really a word that we use very often anymore, busybodies. We'll look at that for a minute. The word busybody speaks of someone who meddles in somebody else's life. It speaks of bustling about uselessly, to busy yourself about trifling, needless, useless matters. It's used of a person overly inquisitive about other people's affairs, it's speaking of somebody who's always on Facebook. No, it's a... Uh... <laughs> there are some who are appointed to read your posts and correct you. Have you noticed that? That's their call in life, is correcting people. They've got time on their hands, so they use it to meddle in other people's affairs. He says, when you're not working, you have time on your hands. When you have time on your hands, you fill that time up with doing things. But because you're not working and producing a living and all of that, you can end up just meddling in other people's affairs, always giving them counsel, always wanting to know what's going on, give me the details. 
He said, and this is what's taking place. They're not working at all. They're busy bodies. He said in verse 12, now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. And so the bottom line is what they need to do is uh, just do the work that God has called them to do and uh, to not be disorderly at all, not to be a busybody, to work in quietness, eat their own bread. And verse 13, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Do not cease doing good because a few have taken advantage of you. This can cause you to grow callous to genuine needs. In Galatians 6, verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto those who are of the household of faith. Doing good for others is something the church is to be taught to do. Hebrews 13, 16, to do good, to share the gospel, to do good rather, and, and to share, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Titus 3, 14, let our people learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. Here's something for you. Do not grow weary in doing good. There are those who can grow weary doing what is good. They get tired of it. They, they, they can be busy doing something, serving in some way, and it seems that nobody notices what they're doing, and nobody approaches them and says, thank you. They get up early. They arrive to the work, to church, we'll say. They're going to serve, whether it's going to be, we'll say, like an usher or worship team, children's minister, whatever. They show up. They're out there in the parking lot trying to help people to find places to, to park and all. And nobody seems to, to say thank you. Nobody relieves them. Nobody helps them. And they get weary, they get tired because they're busy with no appreciation. And so Paul is saying, don't grow weary in doing good. You know, it's an interesting story that Jesus gives to us. It's recorded for us how that Jesus was at the home of Martha. And when you read the Bible, you'll note that Martha is the older sister of a man named Lazarus and a younger sister named Mary. And Jesus is there. And as Jesus is there at her home, at Martha's home, Martha's busy making a meal. And as Martha's in the kitchen, we'll say the kitchen, making a meal, she begins to notice that her sister isn't doing anything. She's just lazily, in her mind, seated there at the feet of Christ, listening to him. And so she begins to make some noise with those pots and pans, if you will. He starts kind of clattering in there. Let's make it a 21st century thing. It's Thanksgiving, and you got family over, and you're there in your kitchen trying to put together a meal for your family. And as you're putting together some things, you're, you've got the turkey inside the oven. You're waiting to put the rolls in there. You, you have on the, on the stove, you're, you're making a special dish that the family likes. In my case, my wife will make some green beans, and she'll, she'll put some Tabasco in it, and then she puts some bacon in it. And, oh, man, it's my favorite. And so she's in there. I'm hungry. I, uh, you know, let's close service right now. I, <laughs> But as she does that, she's putting all this, and there's her daughters kind of sitting around talking to me. There's her daughters-in-law, and they're visiting with me. And Marie's in the kitchen. The kitchen is only, where she's at, it's only 20 feet from us. But the girls are busy listening to me. And Marie's looking, and she's saying to herself, you know, this is a lot of work. There's a lot of kids here. There's a lot of things to do. I'm unable to get this all done at one time. It would be a good thing if those girls would get up and, and help me, because after all, I'm feeding them those ungrateful little brats, and she's in there getting upset. And then finally, my wife said, I can't take this anymore. So she goes into the front room, and she looks at the girls, uh, excuse me, are you going to be eating today? And she looks at me, she says, honey, what are you talking about? What are you talking to them about? And I'm there sharing with them about the Lord, and they're listening to that because that's what they do. And I'm saying, you know, this is something that God has shown me, and they're listening, and I'm speaking, but Marie's busy clanging pots and pans, and she's in the other room, and she's not happy, and man, they, they're all going to eat, and they're probably going to leave all these dishes for me to clean up anyway, and then they're going to want to take a plate home. I'm going to burn this turkey, and you know, she's thinking, and so she comes in and says it. Martha, Martha, Jesus says, <laughs> you're concerned about many things. You are overworked with anxiety. Your mind is on the wrong things, Martha. 
Listen, if you're going to serve me, you've got to learn from your sister Mary. You see, because the best way to serve me is to first know what I want. And you need to listen the way she is. You see, the meal is not as important as the spiritual food. And Mary has understood this and chosen that part because she will go in and not make a mess with those pans and not, not make noise with those pans because she'll go in with the right heart to serve. Listen, if you serve the Lord without sitting at his feet, you will grow weary in doing good. You will. You will get tired of being taken advantage of. You'll get tired of thinking nobody notices. You will get tired of the long hours because service to the Lord is not eight to five. Service to the Lord is all the time. We had some from our church, three of the men in our church, who went just on Thursday. They drove to Mexicali. That's over five hours of driving. They arrived there. They got the little trailer that they're going to stay in. And they started ministry shortly after arriving, ministered all day into the night. Next morning, awoke after fighting the mosquitoes. They awoke, and all day they served until the early afternoon doing ministry. They went to a particular colonia that, that is, is such a ferocious place to go to that when they ordered some pizza from outside, can you bring it to this particular place? They had said at first, because the kids wanted to eat uh, pizza there, and they, they had said, what do you guys want to eat? Oh, we'd love some pizza. So they call up the local pizzeria, and they say, we'd like to order these two pizzas. Yes, where are you? We're at this particular place. They said, nope, we don't deliver there because the place is so dangerous that they won't even deliver to it, and that's where they're at. So they stay there. They feed those kids, minister, that they drive home. You know how long it takes to get through the border. And they go through the border crossing. They drive the five hours to get home. And then that's on Friday. On Saturday, one of the guys who went goes with me because I go to Temecula. I get up early in the morning. We leave to Temecula, minister there, and he's gone until early afternoon. Then he's here today, and the rest of them are here today. Ministry isn't an eight to five. And ministry is tiring. Ministry is putting your life on the line. And you can grow weary doing what is good. And if you have somebody in the midst of all of that, this is Paul's context, who's saying, man, I, I need some money. Can you help me? But that person is someone who's able to work. There's work available, but he's choosing not to work. It can make you discouraged. And so that's one of the reasons Paul is saying as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Hold on and continue serving. He goes on in verse 14. If anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person. Do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy. Admonish him as a brother. So he says, and he's speaking of the disorderly members, those who won't work. He says, you need to note that person, verse 14. Take notice of him, and you need to avoid him, because ignoring his sin will not help him. By continuing treating him as a believer, you're encouraging him to remain. There are times that you actually withdraw yourself to give him space to understand what is taking place. There are times that you need to withdraw so that they can say, what's going on? What's wrong? And then they'll be in the place to, to receive the correction. So you can say, this is what's wrong. We spoke to you, shared with you, you resisted that. And a person who's being uh, brought into that uh, discipline can realize how much they're giving up to hold on to their sin. So he's your brother. Make sure that you don't treat him like an enemy, he says in verse 15. Admonish him. Affirm your love for him. Withdraw from fellowship. And it gives him a place of repentance that he might even feel ashamed concerning that. And then he finally says this, verse 16. 
May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle. So I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And so he says, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace. Without God's help, all of your efforts are worthless. May God give you strength to obey. And may God give you peace. You see, only the Lord of peace can produce harmony amongst you. In Psalm 85, 8, it says, I will hear what the Lord God will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. Let them not turn back to folly. And then verse 17 is a sign of the genuineness of this letter. Remember, there was a rumor going out that he had written a letter and it had caused people to stumble. So now he's saying, the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle. So I write, you know this is a genuine thing. And then he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Which is interesting, if you read your Bible, you'll know that, that Saul, who became Paul, was from a place called Tarsus. This gives us evidence that he is from southern Tarsus. Why? Because he said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with y'all. <laughs> There's a little Bible tidbit for you. I used to believe that I lived in South America. And the reason is simple. I live in America. I live in Southern California. Therefore, I live in South America. But anyway... The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. If you depend on the grace of God, you will be able to do his will to the glory of God. And he closes his epistle with grace, with grace. May God himself give you peace and may God himself give you grace. And the only way that you'll ever have peace is when you have his grace. That's how it works in the kingdom of God. Peace always comes through grace.